We shall bring you further news as quickly as we can. Welcome uh, to the next stop on our historical journey on history of diplomacy and technology. Our next stop is Renaissance diplomacy. We travel through different epochs from prehistory and first forms of proto-diplomacy through early civilization of ancient East, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and their invention of writing to ancient Greece with its rich legacy, Rome and Byzantine Empire most recently. And we will link our last session with this one by Harold Nicholson's words. It was the Byzantine who taught diplomacy to Venice. And it was the Venetians who set the patterns for the Italian cities, for France and Spain, eventually for all Europe. And this is exactly one important message from our historical journey. This is a message of continuity in the core functions of diplomacy and changes in the way diplomacy is performed. From smoke signals to the internet, the core function of diplomacy remained the same, peaceful solution of conflicts and representation of interests. Now, uh, before we dive deeper into Renaissance diplomacy, let us place this period in a time sequence. The Renaissance diplomacy lasted somewhere between 14th and 16th century. During this period, there have been many developments in Europe, so-called Middle Age, which are important for the understanding the emergence of Renaissance diplomacy and subsequent de uh, developments. In culture, Great writers emerge in this period to mention just a few, Petrarca, Dante, Boccaccio, among many others. Also the art reached its peak with uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli. At that time, society, European society was deeply damaged by the Black Death plague epidemic in the mid 14th century. Some countries lost 30 to 40 percent of their population, which caused huge social uh, changes. In church, we had a great Western schism, a split between Catholic church lasting uh, between 1378 and 1470, in which bishops residing in Rome and Avignon both claim to be the true Pope. This rival claims to the papal throne damaged the prestige of the Catholic church, and it started uh, losing its authority. It was also the peri period of great discoveries. By 1488, Portuguese had explored and mapped the African coastline down to the Cape of Good Hope. In 1492, Christopher Columbus uh, persuaded the King and Queen of Spain to experiment with the idea of sailing west into the Atlantic and incidentally discovering the new world. It was Renaissance was also a period of great inventions. One of the most important and uh, by far the most influential invention of the 15th century was the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg. It was modeled on the design of existing screw press and it could produce up to 3,600 pages per workday. During our session today, we will see how uh, that invention of printing press, press played the, one of the crucial role in information management and ultimately politics of Renaissance uh, period and beyond. In the politics during this period, a new type of monarchy is gradually emerged in France and Spain. Their goal was to centralize the control of the power of the, over their territories. They replaced the small network of principalities, cities, and duchies. Geostrategically speaking, during this period, the Byzantine Empire collapsed with the fall of Constantinople in the 1453. 
Spain emerged as a new power after completing the reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula in the 1492. France was also united with Louis uh, uh, XI. Germany was divided in small principalities. Poland and Lithuania were important players in the East. The Grand Duchy of Moscow started emerging. And in the South, we have the Ottoman Empire almost well established in the Balkans. Let's see geographically uh, how it was looked. So far, we sketch wider canvas in which Renaissance diplomacy appeared among Italian city states in the 15th century, which is considered this period to be the beginning of modern diplomacy, as we know today, and modern diplomacy with permanent diplomatic missions, embassies. At the time, we had also rudimentary Ministry of Foreign Affairs built around diplomatic archives. It's interesting to highlight importance of diplomatic archives. The Italian Renaissance diplomacy scene consisted of many small city-states and five major ones. The Papal State with Rome as its capital was located, as we know, in central Italy, while the southern part was occupied by the powerful kingdom of Naples. The north of Italian peninsula was dominated by the city-states with their strong manufacturing industry and powerful trading, including the Republic of Venice, the Duchy of Milan, and the Republic of Florence. During this period, the power of the Catholic Church started gradually declining. The major powers, France, Spain, Austro-Hungarian Empire, were not yet that established. And exactly in this historical interregnum, the Italian city-states have found a way to develop their own way of handling internal relations. This period, which lasted between 1350 and 1494, when Italy was invaded by France and gradually got under strong foreign influence, notably later on by Habsburg, this period, the interregnum period, is a period of the flourishing Renaissance diplomacy. The golden age of Italian Renaissance diplomacy started in 1455 with Treaty of Lodi, which was signed a peace agreement between Milan, Naples, and Florence. It put an end to the wars between Milan and Venice, and Treaty of Lodi codified the system of Italian diplomacy among city-states. This period was important as it marked the first long peaceful period after centuries of wars among the Italian city-states. And it lasted till 1494 when Italy was invaded by France. Therefore, this is more or less the setting of the Italian Renaissance diplomacy. In the 16th century, this type of diplomatic practice, which was developed in Renaissance diplomacy, spread throughout the Europe towards England, Spain, initially through representatives of Italian city-states to these countries, and later on with the exchange of ambassadors, it grown in more fully fledged diplomacy. The emergence of Renaissance diplomacy is usually associated with two main characteristics of relations among Italian states, city-states. First is the lack of hegemonic power, and second is a strong interest in cooperating and solving problems and conflicts through peaceful means. These two building blocks are important because we'll see them later on during the 19th century where uh, Kissinger was ex basically describing that period as a balance of power period. Therefore, the key is that there is no hegemonic power and second, that it is better to negotiate, engage, reach compromise than, uh, than uh, fight and uh, impose uh, military solutions. Italian city-states were too weak to impose themselves on their neighbors. Their armed forces consisted of mercenaries who were mainly interested in earning money and surviving. The Italian city-states could not rely a lot on military power. And this weakness, if you can call it, created the ideal space for diplomacy. The only political tools, the rules of Italian city-states, they had was the diplomatic so-called combination and uh, which is uh, described in a really complex and heavily loaded Italian word 
combinazioni that was survived until our time. And sometimes uh, people say that it describes well Italian, uh, current Italian uh, political life. How was diplomacy practice? What was the structure of diplomacy, Renaissance diplomacy? It is widely accepted in study of diplomatic history that the first permanent diplomatic mission was established in 1450, representing Duke of Milan to Cosimo de' Medici of Florence. The first envoy was Nicodemo di Pontremoli, known as Sweet Nicodemus. Italian Renaissance diplomacy was uh, commercially driven and the Italian diplomats were often bankers or traders. Among diplomats, there were also well-known names such as Dante, Petrarca, Boccaccio in the 14th centuries and Machiavelli or Guicciardini in the early 16th centuries. The main task of resident uh, ambassador was to gather information and develop relations. Not that different from our era. At that time, in a world without newspapers or internet, uh, diplomats and ambassadors became crucial intelligence gatherers. They reported on the arrival of cargoes, the situation at court, the state of alliance, military pre uh, preparations, the atmosphere in the market, political gossips, they needed diplomats at that time to have a good manners and good oratory skills. At the end of the 15th century, Ludovico Sforza, Duke of uh, Milan, stated that the word of prince was seen in the man he sent to represent him abroad. Back in the capital, new ministries proto-ministries of foreign affairs starting emerging. First, uh, firstly, the ministries emerged around archives of diplomatic reports, and later on they transformed into more sophisticated system for collecting and an analyzing information and coordinating diplomatic actions. Diplomatic reporting was the key tool for communication between diplomatic missions and capital. Ambassadors were very busy writing a report. Some of them dispatched one report every day. Many reports or nowadays cables, diplomatic cables contain gossip about prominent personalities and life in the cities where ambassadors served. Venice was the most advanced state in developing reporting techniques. Beside these daily reports, which were, were going between uh, embassies, Renaissance embassies and camp, uh, capitals, uh, ambassador had a duty to prepare special reports called relazioni, which provided a strategic overview of the relationship between Venice and the country where the ambassador served. At the end of the mission on the return back to Venice, each ambassador was supposed to deliver a speech with detailed information about the situation in the state where the envoy was on mission. And after the session, the Grand Chancellor would include it in the secret archive of diplomatic documents. A Venetian official explained the reason for archiving these documents. That way documents will be saved forever and reading of it could be useful to enlighten our present rulers and those who will come in the position in future. This is very important. And whenever uh, I teach diplomacy and uh, diplomatic negotiation, I try to rely on uh, diplomatic, uh, historical diplomatic uh, reports or uh, cables. But recently with WikiLeaks, we got also modern uh, archive. And if you analyze, if you compare archives of Renaissance diplomacy with those which were released by WikiLeaks, the diplomatic cables of State Department, you can see a lot of parallels in style, coverage, dynamics, and, uh, and the different uh, reporting techniques that were used five centuries ago, and which are not in essence different 
today. What were the main developments? First Renaissance diplomats enjoyed diplomatic privileges and immunities. The person, premises, and communication of diplomats were protected by diplomatic immunities, similar to nowadays the privileged immunities. Renaissance diplomacy also inherited aspect of elaborate Byzantine ceremonies. Every detail of diplomatic protocol was negotiated as illustrated by words of Harold Nicholson. At what exact stage in the proceeding should the ambassador remove or replace his hat? That was negotiated by protocol officials because there was high relevance and high focus on the importance of, uh, of uh, signaling, protocol signaling and uh, overall protocol and etiquette. The Italians were well aware that it was important to influence the public, to influence the public in the, on the other state. In this period, especially with the invention of the printing pens, we have an early form of public diplomacy or what is called today Twitter diplomacy. Public diplomacy of this period also relied on personal communication and prominent personalities to shape the opinion of Italian city-states. We named some of them, some famous writers and artists. During this period of slow and undeveloped transportation and communication, diplomats were among the few with the privileges of traveling to remote places and bringing back information. In some cases, they were involved in what we can call early science diplomacy. Today is very popular topic, uh, science diplomacy, but it could be traced back, especially when it comes uh, involving countries that were expanding their colonial exploration, such as Spain and Portugal. I'll give you one historical example. French ambassador to Portugal, Jean Nico, sent lemon and banana trees as well as indigo imported from Asia back to Paris, from Portugal to Paris. He was also first to bring tobacco to Paris and it was after him that nicotine got its name. It's a little diplomatic trivia that, uh, that uh, shows importance of diplomats as the first science dipl uh, diplomats who were conveying and passing scientific insights or new discoveries back to their capital. Later on in the 16th century, the concept of marriage diplomacy, another in innovation developed, not that much in Italy, but in the rest of Europe. The complexity of marriage negotiation in the 16th century, uh, dynastic rules was at the heart of the foreign affairs. One of the famous marriages that affected European history of that time was the one between the King of England, Henry VIII, and Anna Bole, that resulted in the creation of the Anglican Church independent of the Vatican with consequences that uh, exist till very days. And you can see on the slide this painting of Hans Holbein uh, called the ambassador. If you are based in London, if or you pass through London, you can visit National Gallery and see this uh, important painting. Uh, and you can see about uh, that time, painted in London in the 1533, the life-size double portrait shows Jean de Dinteville, once the French ambassador to the court of Henry VIII of England, with fellow diplomat Georges de, de Salle, Bishop of Lavre. Uh, Francis I had sent two ambassadors to persuade the King of England, Henry VIII, not to divorce his wife, Catherine of uh, Aragon. They, like others, were unsuccessful and history took its course with divorce, marriage of Anna Boleyn, and the creation of Anglican Church, uh, as we realize, independent of the Vatican. Apart from historical context that this painting is, uh, is uh, showing, let me just uh, uh, also explain how this painting uh, described the spirit of time and the role of diplomats. As you can see between two ambassadors, 
is uh, uh, between uh, is the, there are two shelves full of objects with strong symbolic meaning. The shelves between the uh, uh, have the on the lower lower shelf. Uh, you have so-called earthy, earthy symbols, including a globe, a merchant calculus book, a lute with a broken string, and the Lutheran hymn book. These items represent earth, earthly interest in the disorderly dispute that accompanied them. This was like reality. The two diplomats, through their work, should overcome this earthy earthly conflicts, daily conflicts, and elevate society to the second upper shelf that symbolize a stable heavenly order represented by tools of astronomy, science symbolic optimism of Renaissance era. Here we have the elements of Renaissance and science. The function of diplomats is to bridge these two shelves, the earthly and heavenly ones. Although they relied on science and the power of human creativity, the presence of skull, you can see it at the bottom of the painting, is a reminder that the pride in human knowledge and power it gives can be, uh, can be vain. There are limits of our force, of our power, of our imagination and science. And I think that painting, it's very relevant for our era where we are putting um, a uh, really strong, strong focus on science, sometimes not seeing the limits of science as a solution for the conflicts in uh, society. Let's focus on papal diplomacy. Uh, it was one important, one of the main diplomats developed in the Middle Age were papal uh, diplomats representing Vatican. The Vatican's main objective was to keep doctrinal control over Europe and to suppress any action aimed at challenging the role of the Roman Catholic Church. Papal diplomats papal, uh, used a variety of diplomatic tools such as negotiation, treaty making, alliances and arbitration, and developing considerable expertise in espionage, subversion and conspiracy. In addition to its theological and doctrinal interest, the Roman Catholic Church had complete control over what we can call the information technology of the day till invention of Gutenberg's printing press. One of the main reasons was the choice of technology for exchange of information. The decision by the church to use, to adopt parchment over papyrus favored the spread of papal monastic network throughout Western Europe for more or less, we can say, three main reasons. First, unlike papyrus, which was grown almost exclusively in Egyptian Nile Delta region, parchment was ideally suited to decentralize agrarian rural monastic networks because Individual monasteries could remain self-sufficient manufacturing parchment from the skin of their own livestock. Second, the collapse of the Roman Empire and its trading system resulted in nearly total disappearance of papyrus from Western Europe. Parchment thus became the dominant med medium of communication and however, Inadvertently, the Roman Catholic monastic order became the chief supplier of this material. Thirdly and finally, and perhaps most important, very few people were literate during the Middle Age. The norm for Western Europeans, for whom much of life was violent and chaotic, was the spoken word, thus further reinforcing the church monopoly on the written word. The relationship between parchment and the power of the Roman Catholic Church is a clear illustration where the mode of communication favored the interests of the church. Indeed, the clergy became the sole custodian and supplier of the written information, which had a significant impact on its share of power. The church's monopoly over language and written word provided it with an advantage in the diplomatic scene of the Middle Age. The missions of other players, such as the Frankish state represented by Charlemagne, 
he had to have at least one clergyman because they were the only literate individuals at that age. This made it possible for the church to be completely informed and to strongly influence the diplomatic developments of the Middle Age. Let us reflect on the some tools, diplomatic tools. Combinazioni was the key modus operandi of Italian city-states at that time. Urban centers emerged, population by merchant and trade classes able to defend themselves. Money replaced land as the medium exchange. The Italian politics was tangled net of alliances, conspiracies and deception. The Combinazioni were a result of this specific environment that emerged in Italian city-states. As we mentioned before, Italian city-states could not promote their interests through the use of military force. They had to rely on diplomacy and the key tool was Combinazioni, different arrangement of players in the country on the level of the city-states themselves. Other tools used uh, uh, include frequently changing alliances between city-states, borrowed from the Byzantine diplomacy, and spying, which became trademark of Renaissance diplomacy. Louis XI advised his ambassador, foreign envoys are lying to you, lie to them more. On this moral deficiency of Renaissance diplomacy, Harold Nicholson wrote, they bribed, they stimulated and financed rebellions, they encouraged opposition party, they intervened in the most subversive way in the internal affairs of the countries to which they were accredited. They lied, they spied, they stole. Now this context of the Renaissance diplomacy and the sp uh, spirit, it is important to uh, understand and to interpret one of the famous saying quote, which you can find in many tourist shops. Sir Henry Wotton, the envoy of English King to Venice said, the ambassador is an honest man sent to lie abroad for the good of his country. Uh, whereby lie meant both lying abroad, residing or lying or staying somewhere and lying not telling the truth. This was a pun which is usually not reported. The problem was that Wotton's pun was lost in translation from English to Latin. The translator removed the ambiguity using only the meaning to deceive. And this famous quote almost ended Wotton's career. His quote was used in Latin by the Catholic uh, author Scipius to show how devious were Protestant diplomats. Just to remind you, Sir Wotton represented James uh, I, an English king uh, of Anglican and, uh, and the Protestant uh, religion. Sir Wotton managed to save his career and reminded in the service of James I after this incident. However, uh, uh, his quote explained a common mis or perception of diplomacy, which remains relevant in our time. It also shows the power of double meaning in diplomacy. However, a solid diplomacy at that time and nowadays requires trust and, trust and correctness. If something is said, it should be truth. Otherwise it should not be said. Building the trust, building the engagement is crucial for negotiation and for uh, reaching the compromise. Let's see other developments in the uh, Renaissance era. Renaissance era is marked by profound technological and technical advancement. The most important technological advancement of all was, as we already discussed, development of the printing press by the Gutenberg, uh, Johannes uh, Gutenberg. The invention spread like the wind, reached Italy in 1467, Hungary, Poland, Scandinavia, by 1,500, around 6 million books were produced in Europe. Without the printing press, it is impossible to conceive that the Renaissance would have occurred in the way it was occurred. The invention of the printing press had a considerable impact on all functions of society, including diplomacy. 
the church, church's dominance through parchment-based writing was challenged. The church's participation in diplomacy gradually started to decrease and to decline. Clergymen no longer had a monopoly on literacy. No longer were they an indispensable part of uh, almost every diplomatic mission. What the world is today, good and bad, it owes to Gutenberg. Everything uh, can be traced to this source, but we are bound to bring him homage for the bad that his colossal invention has brought about uh, uh, in overshadowing a thousand times by good with which mankind has been favored. Was the, were the words of Mark Twain, famous American uh, writer. Therefore, there is a mix of good and bad news. Let's see what has been happening outside European space. In the past, we were focusing on India, China. Last month, we focused on the developments in Mongol Empire. We'll move now towards West, to the Aztec Empire. And it was uh, developed with a shifting and fragile Aztec Empire of three uh, principal city-states. The largest and the most powerful among the three was Tenochtitlan. The Aztec Triple Alliance exerted tremendous power over central Mexico for just 100 years before falling to Spanish conquistador led by Hernan Cortes. The Aztec were famous for the cruelties used to remain in power, but they also knew how to negotiate with neighboring cities. Instead of bloody wars resulting in a great number of captives that would be sacrificed to the gods in order to keep the sun rolling across the skies, the rivers were offered protection, stability, and economic integration into a flourishing trading system. This was an important aspect of Aztec Empire. If the enemies decide to subdue, the city-state would keep its ruling dynasty and more or less order. In return, they had to pay the annual tribute, send its soldiers to fight along with Aztec and acknowledge the supremacy of Aztec gods. If the city of region could fail to subdue after peaceful diplomatic persuasion led by Aztec uh, ambassador, principal city would be sacked and its king, nobility, and warriors all sacrificed to Aztec gods. All of the kings and diplomats of the subdued city had to witness this uh, gruesome act. Therefore, it was an interesting, that was uh, in a way, um, a carrot and stick policy that we can see, we saw it with Mongols and we see till our days, either subdue to the power or uh, you will be forced to subdue power. Obviously today we have much more sophisticated methods, but that remains an important, in its sense, important technique. The choice laid in front of the enemy was uh, quite clear and Aztec relied on their reputation for ruthlessness to raise the stakes of every potential war. The empire was in fact a very broad alliance kept together by the fear of bloody reprisal against the uh, mutineers. However, it turned out to be the key to their demise except for trade. There was nothing but fear that held the whole structure together. At its height, the Aztec Empire consisted of nearly 400 allied cities with about 3 million people living in them. And in the end, it wasn't the war that swiped the Aztec Empire. It was the disease that European brought, smallpox and measles. The native uh, lacked immunity to them, and the population fell by 40% in just one year. This made them an easy target for the European invaders. Mexico City was built on the ruins of the Aztec capital, and it quickly became the prim premier European center in the new world. That was a so short excursion in the, in the Latin America, but now in our tradition to 
to uh, uh, have a drink of the era. Uh, we have a today uh, drink which gained popularity in the in the in the 15th century. This is so called uh, aqua vitae, a strong spirit distilled from wine. And it is the first reliable mention by a celebrated French alchemist and physician Arnaud de Villeneuve, who died in 1313 and who gave its name of aqua vitae or water of life, capable of uh, rejuvenating those uh, who uh, partook of it. And as such was only purchasable at an extremely high price. Unlike this, uh, this brandy, uh, which, was, uh, which was nicely labeled, the brandy of our brandy of our historical historical journey. But before before we, we, we tried the water of life was truly an extraordinary medicine, both mixed with the other ingredient or on its own. But what was it? Why was it so amazing? Why would anyone think that strong alcohol was the water of life? In the late Middle Age, Life expectancy at birth was roughly 30 years, although if a person survived to age 20, he could expect to make it up to 45. During uh, in the mid uh, uh, 14th century, the Black Death wiped out one third of the population of Europe. In a world so full of dangers, many alchemists in Europe went looking for an elixir of life, a potion that could delay aging delay death, fight sickness, or even produce immortality. And as an ingredient, strong alcohol seemed highly promising. It could preserve herbs, fruit, flowers, and meat. So why could it not also help preserve the human body? But it wasn't just the preservation quality that made distilled alcohol seem special, whether you call it aqua vita or aqua ardens, burning water, or aqua ignea, fiery water, it came from fire. And many alchemists believe distillation actually put fire into the base liquid, making alcohol a combination of two elements, fire and water. And it appeared from a colorful liquid as a transparent vapor coiling through the tubes, smoke just as a spirit. And this is probably the etymological origin of the word spirit. Medical thought at that time was dominated by ancient Greek idea of balancing humors in the body, the hot and the cold, the wet and the dry. Aqua vita was cold, but produced a warming feeling. It was wet, but had a drying effect. And of course it affected both mind and body extremely quickly. The term aqua vita meant not only a distilled spirit, but also a complex mi mixture. One German recipe, not, not in this example, created by a noble female distiller required 387 ingredients and nine separate distillations spaced over two years to make the white aqua vita. 28 more ingredients and six more months were needed to complete the yellow aqua vita. While this and many other recipes were prized for their medical value, it didn't take people long to realize that uh, they can get drunk. After one Irish nobleman died from taking a bit more aqua vita, it was recorded in the annals that it was not aqua vita to him, but aqua mortis, uh, water of that. We don't know uh, though, whether this gentleman was drinking uh, um, this powerful drink for health or for pleasure. With that and uh, our traditional cheer, I will, I will try uh, this distillation. Well, I put it quite a bit. Uh, and I would like to invite you to drink whatever you, you have and to um, wish you good health um, and, um, and more fun on this learning journey. Cheers. It's not bad. Therefore, brandy by, by diploma.
Thank you. Uh, I guess it's the right time for, uh, for comments and questions. I can see that we have a quite a busy chat. Um, uh, Katarina, shoot. Yes, uh, we have a very lively discussion going on in the in, in the chat. We have received actually a question from Rodrigo Marquez. He wonders what was the role of Venice in the, the development of Renaissance diplomacy compared to other Italian states? Then uh, we discussed the major changes during the period be between the 14th and the 16th century. And Ginger noted that the biggest change was the invention of the printing press, uh, actually bigger than the internet, today because information finally became widely available and um, accessible. And um, on the same topic, Carla noted that we have seen that the internet, despite being a great way to access knowledge, is also responsible for spreading misinformation. So did something similar happen with the invention of the printing press? Uh, Dietra then said that while she agrees about the printing press, she wonders how much control the length of time needed to produce a printed document and the need for the intermediaries exerted over this communication. Lastly, Alberto wanted to ask if diplomacy for middle age was the cause, the cause of European equilibrium or diplomacy was only a consequence of the European state's relationship in order to avoid war or both things. Mm. We're looking forward to your comments. Thank you, thank you, Kat. Uh, first about Venice. Venice was a trade uh, uh, trend settler uh, and uh, it, uh, it was the most illustrious developer of trade practices, special companies. Uh, um, and the, the other cities, although they had some roles, especially with Genoa or Dubrovnik, uh, they had their own innovation. Dubrovnik had very, very active diplomacy and amazing diplomacy. But I would say that Venice introduced the most innovation, especially around reporting. That way of reporting is very, very impressive. Uh, that was the reason why I highlighted uh, Venice, but I, I don't think that I did a justice to especially Genoa and Dubrovnik. If you go through the Dubrovnik diplomatic archives, you have the fascinating analysis of emerging, for example, emerging uh, uh, American power from the 16th century reports from their diplomats in London saying, oh, uh, 16th, 17th century reports, we have to pay attention about this, what's going on acro across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, when the first, uh, first people came, uh, first um, 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 with my affair and the, the, other, the other boats, the uh, first colonies came to the, to the Americas, Basically, that was fascinating insight and uh, uh, sort of forward-looking analysis. That I always, always advise, and we will send a few links to to read uh, those reports, not only as um, as a record of the time, the, the time, but also as the way how people at that time reflected uh, on developments and, uh, around themselves and what cognitive tools they used to predict the future developments with quite high precision. But Venice, I would put it the first, probably Dubrovnik as the second, and Genoa as a third, if I have to rank the most important city-states in, in, the, in the context of uh, contribution to diplomacy. The second comment was on positive and negative impacts of, of, uh, of writing. Uh, yes, writing was a great innovation, like what is a Twitter or the internet or in general, in social media, but as always, technology is neither good nor bad, not neutral. It brought us a lot of good things, especially writing, in terms of scientific revolution, um, uh, science ideas were exchanged in, in terms of literacy of society. But it was always manipulated. It was also a tool for manipulation. And uh, there are some serious researchers that, for example, uh, Protestant church, which was better in acquiring uh, writing tools, use it in order to demonize in particular Jesuits uh, because they had monopoly of the writing and they reported on the practices of Jesuits, especially during inquisition. That's an interesting study and I will share the, the book about, about that, that arguing basically that at that time, Twitter of that time or Facebook book of that time was in the control of people who were part of the Protestant church and they basically used that 
to demonize uh, to demonize Jesuits for the practice that existed, but it was a bit bit uh, spinned uh, over the proportions. Since killings, the religious killings existed also in Protestant Church and other denominations. It's uh, related to the to the third question of control of printing. That is uh, that is essentially the the. Uh, control of printing was control of power and uh, distribution of uh, power through Europe, whether through this uh, Protestants exercise in their ongoing battle with the uh, with, uh, with the Vatican and Catholic uh, Catholic Church, and they re they realized relatively early that it was important source of power, especially power in shaping public opinion, not necessarily physical power in, of imposing your will on the other side or uh, uh, making submission of the other side, but of shaping the uh, minds and ideas and the, and, uh, and the souls of the, of the people on the other side, which is ultimately the most potent and most important element of, uh, of power, which you can change the way of thinking and framing of the issues and seeing the problems. Therefore, it was one of the major sources of power. And Alberto, your question is, extremely important and extremely relevant. And it is difficult to say whether it was um, diplomacy was a consequence of um, informed decisions. I being the realist in that sense, I think it was a consequence of the other development, especially the plague in the mid 14th century, which, uh, which was external uh, health uh, impact on society and people when many societies realize the limits uh, limits of the power and limits of the force and uh, that created the relatively fertile uh, space for engagement compromise negotiation which didn't last too long it last maybe in italy renaissance italy 50 years between the treaty of lodi and the arrival of french after that we had we had other developments, and uh, there were there were impositions, especially of the Spanish, French Empire, Habsburgs, and then you when you move to 15th and 16th century, other developments. Now, I would argue that unfortunately, uh, countries and societies are not ready for compromise till they face the limit of their power. You see it in nowadays world. You see it, for example, in the region in the Balkans, whoever has a power, whoever has a chance to impose the will is not particularly keen to use a compromise in diplomacy. When they're weak, then they call for compromise. Uh, therefore, that uh, bit skeptical view about the human society and human motivation should be kept in mind when we discuss how diplomacy was used and in what direction diplomatic tools were used. There were all, in many cases, diplomacy as a tool emerged as uh, simply the only option in the circumstances when conflict didn't make a sense and when the sides cannot impose their will on each other. Then some enlightened people came in the fore, forefront and basically realized that they can negotiate and they can discuss and they can make some compromise. Over to you, Katrina. That will be all from my end. We haven't received any other questions. Cheers. Cheers. It, I will take just another, another shot. I won't be carried away. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, we will make a short break during the summer and then in, uh, uh, during the month of July. And then at the end of August, we will continue with the golden age of diplomacy, diplomacy when diplomacy accelerated and came more or less in the form and the function that we know today. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice uh, summer holiday. Stay healthy. And uh, I wish you with the real medicine, not this one. I wish you a lot of personal happiness and uh, good time. Cheers. We shall bring you further news as quickly as we can.